organise all my furniture. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Cronin. I'm the Asia Pacific Security Chair here at the Hudson Institute, and it's a great pleasure to be joined by a panel of experts, including uh, Derek Grossman. Hello there. He's the only man who's really on the Pacific. He's out in California <laughs> joining us uh, on video teleconference. Um, the program today, entitled U.S. Naval Posture and Maritime Security in Southeast Asia, is really looking at a couple of big issues. First one, uh, we'll focus on exactly where the United States Navy and our military force posture in the region stands vis-a-vis -vis especially China as it rises and as it has an assertive strategy for both possibly threatening Taiwan and maritime coercion in the region. Um, and then we're going to be looking much more specifically at countries in Southeast Asia in a Southeast Asia in general, uh, looking at Indonesia, looking at the Philippines, Vietnam, but also talking about all Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, where coercion has been continuing to grow uh, in this sort of flashpoint sea that's so critical for sea lines of communication, critical for US allies and partners. Um, the United States, 10 years ago, this year, um, with Secretary Hillary Clinton at the ASEAN Regional Forum, at a famous exchange with the Chinese and with her counterparts there, talking about how America was back and we're here to stay in South, Southeast Asia and South China Sea. Um, the Chinese foreign minister at the time had a different take on that, trying to explain to Singapore and others uh, that China was a big country and they were small countries and that was a fact. Um, and we saw the 2010s uh, where China essentially made all the incremental progress they were looking for, including building these fortifications, these outposts in the South China Sea. <clears throat> that was the 2010s. It didn't have a name. The 2020s is generally known as the decade of concern in people who follow this region because this is where the confluence of a declining US relative uh, naval presence and power, um, at least relative to China's rapid increase in capabilities, <clears throat> and the concern about uh, coercion and political warfare strategies being exercised against Taiwan and as well as against the Philippines, Vietnam, but even Indonesia being caught up in, in a lot of this pressure strategy, but also Malaysia, Brunei, and others in the region. Um, there's a great concern that China may continue to be more assertive in, in how it's pursuing uh, its rules toward the region. Um, anyway, we're going to get into all of these issues, and we're going to start uh, with my, my good colleague, Seth Cropsey, who's senior fellow. He's director of the Center for American Sea Power at the Hudson Institute. He's a co-author of a couple of great books on uh, our Navy and our Navy's both uh, great history, but also its problems. Um, the last one, Sea Blindness, How Political Neglect is Choking American Sea Power and What to Do About It, uh, as well as Mayday, The Decline of American Naval Supremacy. That decline of American naval supremacy is indeed a com common theme, and it's one that he's been one of the clearest voices on. And yet, we're not listening enough to Seth Cropsey about how we turn this around, especially when you think about uh, what China's doing. Um, so let me just turn to Seth first. We're going to stay seated here. We're going to offer initially five or 10 minutes of remarks, and then we're going to get into some questions. And eventually, we're going to have questions from the audience, or you can send them in. Uh, the screens show you how to send in through Twitter or Facebook uh, some questions. Um, but Seth, just staying seated, offering this question, then I'll introduce the speakers in turn. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I noticed that I've been put closest to the side here, so easiest to get the hook. Or... <laughs> so I'm going to leave aside uh, the broad questions about China's regional and global ambitions, since the objective here is a tour d'horizon of maritime security in Southeast Asia. Um, our discussion here today was not intended comprehensively to address last June's uh, Defense Department Indo-Pacific Strategy Report sober assertion that China aims at, quote, Indo-Pacific regional hegemony in the near term and ultimately global preeminence in the long term. The single most um, important military fact about the regional strategic competition that exists between the U.S. and China 
is that in peace, as it would in war, the contest is a naval one. Barring a world historic change, it is extremely hard to imagine that the US or a US-led coalition would fight a major land war in Asia. Our friends and allies are either islands or nations with extended coastlines, as in the case of South Korea, um, a peninsula. Oceanic stretches separate Taiwan, Japan, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Australia from China. Uh, Vietnam and South Korea are less fortunate. The proximate cause of a conflict between the US and China is impossible to foresee. But closer to the ultimate cause is China's certain effort to separate us from our Asian allies and friends while preserving its ability to import raw materials and export finished goods by sea. Another strategic fixity is geography. The waters inside the so-called first island chain and those that extend through the Asian archipelago are much closer to China than they are to the United States. From the US Navy base in San Diego to the center of the South China Sea is approximately 7,500 miles. From the People's Liberation Army Navy, known as PLAN, Southern Fleet Base in Zhangjiang to the same geographic coordinate is about 435 miles. The US Navy's forward deployed vessels home ported in Japan, as well as the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force and 5th and 7th Air Forces are as powerful in capability as they are insufficient in numbers compared to the PLA's nearby naval, air, rocket, marine, and ground forces. Currently, the PLAN possesses two aircraft carriers. And by the way, this is going to be an approximate approximation of the balance, the military balance here, because I'm leaving certain categories of ships, vessels out. Uh, so it's not an exact number. And I don't want it to be taken as an exact number. But uh, for gross purposes, the, the Chinese Navy consists of two aircraft carriers, 36 destroyers, 30 frigates, nine large amphibious vessels, 10 logistics ships, 30 diesel electric, and eight nuclear powered attack submarines, and six nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines, for a total of about 124 ships. Those that are not in immediate maintenance or extended overhaul can be easily concentrated in the West Pacific. The US possesses 11 aircraft carriers, 90 cruiser destroyer surface combatants, zero frigates, 25 littoral combat ships, 34 large amphibious vessels, 30 logistic ships, 57 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 14 nuclear-powered ballistic missile carrying subs for a total of about 261. But as I say, the number is actually higher than that because I'm not going to get into the details of uh, mine mine warfare and patrol craft. Uh, those of the enumerated combatants that are not in port for short or long-term um, repair and maintenance are spread out from the oceans of the Western Hemisphere to Europe, the Mediterranean, the Persian Gulf, and, of course, East Asia. This is why the US Navy can legitimately be called a dispersed oceanic global fleet. As useful as it would be for the US political and military leadership to declare that all of our available military can be sent to, to East Asia were a conflict to occur, everyone understands that this would take weeks, weeks or even months and open vulnerabilities where foes, for example, Iran or Russia, might seek to exploit our absence for however long the US military was absent. However, I do not wish to suggest that numbers, numbers of ships answer the question of maritime security and naval post posture, especially in Southeast Asia. They don't. Several other important diplomatic, 
operational, asymmetric, economic, and strategic elements really have to be considered alongside comparisons of ship types and numbers. China, for example, is increasing its fleet and their amphibious capability that could be used against Taiwan, as well as to contest the straits through which ships must pass to and from the Middle East and Europe. The PRC continues its investment in the so-called Belt and Road Initiative that stretches through the Indian Ocean and Suez, Israel, Greece, and even into Northern Europe. Throughout this vast area, China seeks to expand its economic influence, bypass potential vulnerabilities at sea, gain seagoing access to the entire Eurasian landmass, and establish military relationships intended to blossom into strategically tangible future benefit. Think of China's activities in Southeast Asia as the core, and its debt diplomacy, Belt Road Initiative, purchase of port facilities, et cetera, et cetera, as the mantle of what uh, General Secretary Xi calls the China dream, that is, the rise to global preeminence by 2049. Core and mantle reinforce one another and multiply hard and soft power, eventually coalescing into one. Then there is China's effort to keep the US from communicating with its East Asian allies as protecting the uh, oceanic approaches, approach to the mainland. Known as anti-access area denial, or A2AD, China continues to build a network of missiles, some with the advertised but yet to be proven ability to target a ship underway at a distance of over 1,000 miles. Then there's also land-based aviation, cyber, and satellite capabilities. The lesson our foes learned from Desert Shield and Storm is to keep US forces out of the area from which they can be effective. There are other challenges to the US's ability to provide maritime security in Southeast Asia. Chinese regional strategy is keenly attuned to gray zone aggression, bullying threats, <coughs> Um, intimidation that fills the murky gap between war and peace. Examples include, as I mentioned, debt diplomacy, uh, cyber attacks, disinformation, paramilitary forces, and the use of economic leverage, to name but a few. China's use of its Coast Guard and fishing vessels to challenge Japanese sovereignty in the Senkaku Islands nearly four years ago is a fine example of gray zone paramilitary operations. Authoritarian states that respect neither domestic nor international law and custom are best suited to use these tactics. They must be considered in any comprehensive effort to understand the scope of maritime security challenges that face the US in Southeast Asia. Although China has a host of economic problems that include the current trade war, a slowing economy, an aging population for which there is little money to provide support, and the burden of sustaining unprofitable state-owned enterprises, we have a major economic problem for which there appears no solution. You may have noticed the Congressional Budget Office reported earlier this week that by the end of this decade, the national debt will reach $31.4 trillion as we continue to run up annual deficits of over a trillion dollars. This will equal nearly our projected GDP at that point. Combined non-discretionary spending on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and servicing the debt, uh, there will be very little, if any, left over for defense spending. If we do not address this issue, there is another challenge that must be considered when thinking about the United States' ability to provide maritime security in Southeast Asia, or in fact, anywhere in the world. Finally, <coughs> and that is, there is the naval challenge that subordinates nearly all the others I've mentioned. To be effective, fleet size and the kind of ships we build require a strategic vision. If a Navy's strategic justification 
is to convoy supply vessels from the US to Europe, submarines and surface ships equipped with defensive and offensive capabilities are required. If naval strategy is directed at threatening a land power on its seaward flanks as a means of distracting an enemy from ground action in the center, large aircraft carrier battle groups are needed to project power from the sea to important shore targets. I will conclude. The National Defense Strategy of 2018, published when Jim Mattis was Secretary of Defense, correctly identified the reemergence of great power competition as the US's foremost strategic issue. But uh, how is this to be done? What should our goal be if there is a major conflict with China? Is it destroying the shore installations and bases from which the PLAN would conduct operations? Is it destroying China's merchant fleet on which its economy depends? Sinking the PLAN's combatants, the protecting the sea lines of communication, is that it? Or seizing the choke points through which shipping between Asia and the Middle East, Europe and Europe pass? We haven't answered those questions. I'm afraid to say in many cases we haven't asked them. What does China value the most? And how can American strategy place what China prizes at risk? American security policy's lack of an answer makes it difficult to know what kind and how many ships we must build and have to retain our current position as a great power, both in the Pacific and in the world. Thank you for listening. Seth, thank you very much uh, for that uh, excellent synthesis of the, of the challenge really facing, I think, Americans as we think about the, the broad issues. Um, we're going to dig a little bit deeper now into the countries of Southeast Asia. And it's a great pleasure to have an old friend, Natalie Sambi who is the executive director of Verve Research, which is a fast rising uh, independent research organization that really is filling a vacuum because there's no other place I know of that can try to understand the, the civil military relationship in Southeast Asian countries. Um, and Natalie knows the region, but she also knows uh, the Indonesian armed forces as well as anybody I know. Um, and she's also a research fellow at the Perth US Asia Center uh, and publishes widely on these issues. So Natalie, over to you. Thank you so much, Patrick. I just want to thank the Hudson Institute for hosting us today. Thank you so much, Patrick. And thank you, everybody, for coming, making your time to hear about these maritime issues. Um, to give you a bit of an idea about Indonesia, let's start with a couple of numbers and a little bit of, of uh, dimension here. So Indonesia is a country of 260 million people. And those are people of diverse religious, linguistic, and ethnic backgrounds that are dispersed over 16 to 17,000 islands that has a span of about the size of the United States. For Australia, we think about Indonesia a lot. Being to our north, it is at a strategic nexus between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. It is a critical state, not just in Southeast Asia, but within this Indo-Pacific strategic construct as well. So in that context, having been what is characterized a maritime nation, Indonesia hasn't had that long a strong emphasis on thinking about its maritime domain. That is, until around 2014, when President Joko Widodo went from becoming the, go the governor in Jakarta to being elected as the president of the country. And last year, he was elected for a second five-year term that began in October 2019 as well. So when he came into power in 2014, he unveiled this vision for Indonesia called the Global Maritime Fulcrum. So just briefly, it was designed to kind of promote Indonesia's thinking about itself as a maritime nation that was predicated on reinvigorating its sense of maritime economy, maritime tourism, and also issues like maritime defense as well. So Jokowi's idea was to put emphasis on this and to build up maritime infrastructure that helped connect all of those islands together to make it easier and cheaper to move goods between islands and also build up this sense of being of strategic importance between the Indian and Pacific Oceans as well. Now we can debate how effective this global maritime fulcrum vision has been, but there's been some speculation lately that this particular policy is now dead. The first point I would like to make today is I don't think the GMF is dead. It's probably just in hiding. And the reason I say that is because the president has stopped referring to the global maritime fulcrum. 
Now, I would say that it lives on, but we need to temper our expectations of what we wanted the Global Maritime Fulcrum to do. When Jokowi first came in in 2014, I and many of my other colleagues and observers said, awesome, Indonesia is about to step up and play this significant role as this maritime player, as a naval force, as a diplomatic actor. And yes, it has done all of those things in short measure. But we must remember that for Jokowi, he is very much an internally focused president. Global Maritime Fulcrum needs to remain a domestic policy. And that it's because in Jokowi's mind, and rightly so, Indonesia needs to consolidate a lot of its domestic issues. It needs to boost economic growth. It needs to close inequality. Um, and it also needs to make things like traffic much more efficient. But Indonesia also wants to play this active external role. But again, we must remember that this internal consolidation is what focuses Jokowi's mind. And that is what will take a lot of the attention when it comes to thinking about the maritime domain. And we know Jokowi is not so focused on thinking about maritime security in an external sense. He's less interested in foreign policy and security. He has delegated a lot of the important portfolios that regard uh, external thinking policy to other players. He's kept on his foreign minister, Retno Masudi, and he's actually handed the defense portfolio to his political opponent from the last election, Prabowo Subianto. Um, and I think we can talk a little bit during the Q&A about what some of the implications of that have been. So that's the first point I want to make. Global Maritime Fulcrum, Indonesia's flagship maritime thinking policy, is not dead. It's just in hiding, and it's internally focused. The second point I want to make is that while the GMF has been internally focused, there have been some really important dividends for Indonesia's foreign policy. Five years of thinking of itself as an Indo-Pacific player and incorporating an emphasis on maritime policies has flowed on into the regional security agreements it has signed with other players. And this makes itself most manifest in the shared vision between India and Indonesia on the Indo-Pacific as well. There also is made manifest in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So within all this thinking are enshrined these maritime focus, foci. And that gives a space for many of us as partners and gives a policy mandate to expand on some of these. Indonesia has also continued its strong participation in forums like ASEAN, where again, many maritime issues are discussed, EORA, um, smaller minilateral gatherings like the Bali process, and has started a foreign policy reorientation towards the South Pacific, countries for whom the maritime domain is paramount. And of course, Indonesia is engaged in other maritime um, foreign policy initiatives, such as maritime security patrols with Malaysia and the Philippines. But I would like to say again, you know, while this is emphasis on the internal thinking about maritime policy, there is a potential there to grow this external policy further. There are limitations to Indonesia's strategic thinking as a maritime player, and largely that is constrained by the strategic culture within the country itself. And that has largely been a land-dominated uh, mentality. And that is further reinforced not just by the history and a lot of the operations that the Indonesian military has undertaken since its history from 1945 onwards. In fact, as a slide I showed yesterday, which the majority of operations, if not all bar one of the Indonesian military, have been domestic, whether it's insurgency, anti-separatism, terrorism, all bar one have been more or less land and internally focused. And that strategic thinking and that mentality is further reinforced by the fact that the president himself is surrounded by largely currently serving or a former um, active uh, army personnel. And whether that's key people in his ministries or his advisors, but also there's a limitation of generational thinking. Let me give you an example. The incoming, what I, I, who I think will be the incoming uh, chief of the military, was the current chief of army, um, General Antika Prakasa, is the son-in-law of one of Jokowi's close advisors, General A.M. Hendra Priyono, Again, who himself an army general as well. So what I'm trying to say is that there's this reinforcement of these kinds of thinking. And I think this could place some limitations on the expansion of Indonesia's maritime thinking as well, despite that being a necessity. So what does this all mean in practice? The Global Maritime Fulcrum, traditionally internally looking, has had foreign policy dividends. But when it comes to practice, how Indonesia deals with its maritime domain, I think some of the challenges have been brought to the fore with what's happened recently in the recent Natuna Islands dispute. So just quickly as a summary, on the 11th of December, there were four Chinese Coast Guard vessels, one provincial level Chinese mar marine surveillance vessels, and a number of different fishing vessels that entered Indonesia's EEZ. Now, this was only alerted to the Indonesian authorities, I think, some days afterwards. And these ships kept going in and out of Indonesia's EEZ for an entire month. 
that's quite extraordinary if you think about you know other fishing vessels, foreign fishing vessels coming into your waters, operating not just flagrantly being there, but actually allowing illegal fishing to be conducted as well. So in response, Indonesia mobilized not only its Coast Guard, but some of its largest military deployments uh, since 2018, which included 600 troops, uh, two corvettes, uh, Air Force Boeing 737s for maritime surveillance. But that was at the tactical level, and there was some deterrent, but a limited deterrent effect. And in fact, our colleagues over at AMTI have recently published an excellent overview of the movements of some of these ships and the limited effect that some of this deterrence uh, might have had. The issue we see is the response at the policy level, that Indonesia seemed to have quite a, a mixed response, that there was quite a hard uh, level of language from the, the president, you know, a stronger response from Bakama and the military. The foreign minister tended to couch China's incursions in more legal terms, wanting to there be an appeal to international law and to UNCLOS, whereas other ministers, like the defense minister, Prabowo Subianto, and the coordinating minister for maritime affairs, Luhu Panjaitan, seemed to take a bit more of a conciliatory approach when it came to China, using words carefully emphasizing the fact that China is our friend. And of course, that is because for the sake of Indonesia's economic growth, it has to source investment and trade with various partners in China, plays an extremely uh, important part of that picture. And of course, on that spectrum of hard, legal, and soft approaches on China, there was also just the bewildering, which is that the maritime affairs minister actually flat outright denied that there were any Chinese incursions in the EEZ at all. So. That's an unusually unexplained statement. But given all of these challenges that Indonesia has, that it's got this maritime policy that still makes work internally, we've got the dividends potentially from its foreign policy emphasis on maritime issues, we see the recent challenges in the Natula Islands, where do we go for here? What is it that we as partners can help with Indonesia, or what should Indonesia be thinking about moving forward within this Indo-Pacific construct? And the first thing I propose is that a vision of the Indo-Pacific is entirely useless without leadership. Without leadership, a vision is just a piece of paper. So there is a space and an opportunity now for a country like Indonesia to lead on issues such as the strengthening of norms within the Indo-Pacific. We do not as yet have an Indo-Pacific wide normative framework. We have an emphasis on ASEAN type instruments, uh, whether that is an emphasis on the EAS or the ARF or the TIC, <laughs> sorry for all the acronyms. Um, but I think Indonesia is well placed to be able to lead on some of these norm structures. It is a middle power, and as, a, as not being a great power and having limited naval capabilities, it is actually uh, a beneficiary of a strengthening of norms in order to be able to use more soft power than hard power. The other additional thing I would say that having Indonesia lead on some of these norms makes it much more palatable for other countries, particularly in Southeast Asia. It is not a norms regime led by China, it is, which may be seen as problematic, and it is not a norms regime that is being led by the United States as well. The United States continues to play an important role in bolstering some of international law and the capability um, of Southeast Asian navies. However, it is better for a normative regime in the region, in the Indo-Pacific, to be led not by China and not by the United States. So by a process of default, it's countries like India and potentially to a lesser extent Japan and Australia as US allies may also be problematic, but I think Indonesia is particularly well placed to try and to instigate this kind of role. And I would propose even a, a, a joint leadership between India and Indonesia might be a starting point as well as an encouragement of this kind of mini-lateralism. An example of, I think, where this kind of dual leadership works really well is the Bali process. That is a forum in which Australia and Indonesia lead on uh, anti-trafficking and transnational issues in the maritime space. So we have examples of this in the Indo-Pacific where we are building together these kinds of normative regimes. But as we know, norms are not enough. We can have soft power on one hand, but we also still must have the hard power as well. And Indonesia is looking to boost its submarine fleet, and has been looking at French submarines as well, but certainly it is the beneficiary of naval and Coast Guard partnerships. And uh, as one of the things I want to highlight in Jokowi's first term, <coughs> standing up of its Coast Guard, the formalization from being a coordinating body into an actual uh, Coast Guard as well. And at the moment, the government is proposing passing through an omnibus law which tries to make it easier for the Coast Guard to make decisions to be a prime responder in the maritime context. But these kinds of processes need further support. And Bakamla, which is the name of the Coast Guard, needs more ships. They cannot just simply be loaned from the Navy. So that's certainly an area of continuing, I think, partnership, not just with the United States and Australia, but other regional navies and Coast Guards as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the greatest challenges is the army-centric thinking as well, so encouraging um, maritime opportunities for the Indonesian military and for the Coast Guard, I think would be quite, quite beneficial. 
um, as well. And the last point I would like to make is thinking about encouraging Indonesia and supporting Indonesia's maritime thinking um, by thinking about security more broadly and more creatively. <laughs> Um, coming from Australia, we think about the South Pacific a lot, and we think about the sea as a source of opportunity and, and threat. Um, but looking at things like how could we bolster Indonesia's involvement in maritime economy? Look at Panjaitan has talked about Indonesia becoming a leader in the maritime economy. And so we have an opportunity to um, provide investment in places like the Natuna Islands. I think Japan is already going to play a role in investing there. But what can we do in terms of providing further cold storage or fuel resupply for some of the fishing vessels coming through? Um, the last maritime minister that was appointed by Jokowi was a woman called Susia Pujastuti, and she had an outstanding, outstanding record in pushing forward some of the stronger policies Jokowi wanted in terms of deterring illegal fishing by having a blow up the boats policy. But one of the other important legacies I want to emphasize that she had was environmental protection. She had a number of squares of kilometers of, of area protected uh, under her watch, and there is a potential for some of these environmental protections to be reversed under her successor, a party politician from Gurinda from the opposition party called Eddie Prabowo. Now, it's those kinds of environmental protections that partners like the United States, Australia, India, Japan could encourage. And also there have been other developments such as the questioning of whether or not the illegal fishing task force will be continued in future. Again, these are the kinds of conversations that we could have with our Indonesian partners, seeing where they need this kind of practical support. So in short, there is no shortage of things for us as partners to Indonesia to do in terms of supporting its maritime domain. Indonesia is and always will be a maritime country, although as I said earlier, it's got numerous things to think about when it comes to its domestic consolidation. So the key for us is understanding not just how to do, but in that list of things to do, which things to get first. Thank you. Well, Natalie, you've given us a lot of thought there on Indonesia. Um, Hudson's looking forward to hosting uh, Lieutenant General Bujojo on Valentine's Day, actually. We're going to have a discussion on trying to align the U.S. free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategy vision with some of the concepts, philosophy coming out of uh, Indonesia. Um, and you've given us uh, a sense that, as Seth did, on, on there's some basic strategic questions that have to be asked from the United States perspective before we even get to the operational and the force structure and the resource issues that are constraining all of our countries. You also mentioned that Indonesia did not want to alienate China over the Natuna Islands, and they ultimately had to make a decision that um, the, uh, I think uh, the president said, well, there are no, sh no Chinese ships there at the moment, is sort of how he finessed that issue. Um, and um, in Singapore, the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute is one of the leading research institutes on Southeast Asia, and they're now in the second year of an annual survey of elite opinion of the 10 Southeast Asian countries, and their report just came out this month, earlier this month, and you, you should see it online because it's chock full of data. Um, yes, they're only elites, but still very the most systematic thing we have, I think, publicly available. And it was instructive that when asked of these elites, would you choose between China and the United States when they were kind of, if forced to do so, a question that they always say, we do not want to be forced to choose. The majority of elites of seven of the 10 Southeast Asian countries sided with China um, because they see it as kind of the winning economy, uh, I think, in terms of the local, uh, local impact. Um, the three that didn't vote that way were the Philippines, Vietnam, and Singapore. Um, so I want to move on uh, now to, to Zach Abuza, who is a professor at the National War College, although the Navy War College would love to hire him, I'm sure. He is uh, a leading Southeast Asian uh, uh, specialist, uh, author of uh, at least five books on, this, on, on the Philippines and on Southeast Asian politics and insurgency. Um, Natalie had mentioned the land dominating, the internal focus. Zach knows all about these issues, and so we were kind of pushing him out of his lane a little bit to try to talk about the Philippines since Duterte is our ally, and yet he is one difficult ally. So, Zach Abuza, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I have to start with the disclosure that I'm here in my own capacity. I don't represent the National War College or the Department of Defense. Um, I'm going to talk about the Philippines, because no country in Southeast Asia has really been at the uh, pointy end of Chinese aggression than the Philippines, though my Vietnamese colleague may disagree with that. Um, the majority of China's artificial islands uh, have been constructed in Philippine waters. And China clearly wants to test the resolve and call into question the reliability of US treaty commitments in the region. Um, now, when you look at 
Philippine maritime security. You have to do it in the context of this is a country that is uh, riddled with internal uh, security challenges. Um, though there has been great progress with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and that peace process, uh, there is still an alphabet soup of different insurgent groups that have uh, pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, um, at least four that I can think of. Um, there is a nationwide communist insurgency to this day. Um, and of course, uh, this is not going to end anytime soon. And I, I hate to be really cynical about this, but uh, I have no choice after studying this for so many years. There is an element of moral hazard. There is no incentive for the security forces there to really finish these insurgencies off because you start to lose that $50 million a year gravy train from the United States. Um, they have to, at some point, take ownership for these internal security problems. Their inability to get or unwillingness to get their internal security in order has a direct bearing on uh, their maritime security challenges. The lion's share of the defense budget, uh, as in Indonesia, remains internally focused. That is their strategic culture. And yet, this is an archipelago nation. When they do think about maritime security, it's actually in ways that we are not thinking about it so much. It's much more rooted in Southeast Asia and tied to counterterrorism. Between March 2016 and January 2017, there, were a spate, or there was a spate of maritime kidnappings. 70 sailors uh, or fishermen were captured, five were killed, and, and 40 more uh, sailors were simply just not taken, though they could have been. Um, that really forced the Philippines' hand. Uh, Malaysia and Indonesia demanded trilateral maritime patrols, um, including the right of hot pursuit into Philippine waters. Um, it was incredible at that time just how un uh the language coming out of uh, both Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta was at this time. Uh, you have to understand that six to seven hundred million dollars a year in coal exports from uh, Kalimantan in Indonesia uh, were jeopardized. This really impacted regional trade, maybe not in the big scheme that we think about it, but for the far-flung provinces that were really important to Jokowi, this really mattered. Um, those maritime, uh, uh, trilateral maritime operations had an immediate impact. 2018 saw almost no maritime operations by the Abu Sayyaf. But unfortunately, since June of last year, they have resumed. We've seen 18 sailors or fishermen kidnapped, um, uh, including most recently five Indonesians taken from uh, their ship right off of the Malaysian state of Sabah. Um, most uh, uh, the Malaysians have boosted their security in the region in something known as ESCOM, um, and they've been uh, uh, shooting first, asking questions later, and that has had an impact. But still, what's really interesting is that the Philippines seems much more vulnerable uh, to pressure from their ASEAN partners than they do from the United States in terms of taking maritime security. So while these trilateral maritime patrols have helped, uh, they remain insufficient. Um, maritime resources at the disposal of all three states are paltry. Uh, not just naval, but maritime coast guard, law enforcement, um, but the Philippines really in particular. The Philippines is simply not up to the challenge of policing its borders. It's not a question of will. This is really a, a, a question of capacity. There are more maritime assets in the Philippines. Um, we have seen a, an, an uptick in new acquisitions in the past few years, and this is positive, but it comes after decades of non-investment. Their flagship is a 50-year-old uh, uh, decommissioned US Coast Guard Hamilton-class cutter. They have two others, one of which had to be towed into Manila Harbor. The Navy just announced that it will decommission 22 ships, some of which are World War II era vessels. This week, a former US minesweeper that last saw service in the Korean War was decommissioned. This is what they are putting out there. And the cost of maintenance and upkeep to keep these things afloat is staggering. Now, they have um, uh, 
uh, acquired two multi-purpose uh, multi amphibian uh, uh, craft from Indonesia. Uh, two South Korean frigates uh, are um, being built by Hyundai Heavy Industries in South Korea. Both of those will be deployed by the end of this year. That is positive. Um, but the maritime reconnaissance remains paltry. The ability uh, to have any overhead or uh, fighter um, cover is really limited. The best weapon that the Philippines has in protecting its uh, uh, maritime claims was the ruling they had won at the Permanent Court of Arbitration that Duterte has shown. This was such a courageous move by them to push forward this case. And it resulted in the most definitive ruling on the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea that we have ever seen. And the problem with international law is you can't haul states to jail, but you can really use that public international pressure. And the Philippines squandered it. When they shelved the ruling, which Duterte did as soon as he came to office, no other state had any incentive to cite it, to call for its enforcement, or even make it the basis of their talking points with the Chinese. Duterte has refused to assert Philippine rights in the South China Sea, arguing it would only make China declare war. This is a horrible straw man argument. He is de facto ceding Philippine territory. What to do with a problem like Duterte? Um, the reality is he has weakened the alliance with the United States, which is the other core instrument that Duterte has. Um, he not only announced his uh, uh, position on the PCA ruling, but during his first trip to China, he announced that he wanted to end the alliance with the United States. Um, he was hoping that this position would lead to a just flood of Chinese investment, BRI funding, AIIB funding. And while some has come, it's been pennies on the dollar, roughly about 10% of what was committed. Um, he has allowed China's maritime militia to run roughshod over Philippine fishermen, and he did not come to their defense. His appeasement towards China is really perplexing. In fact, if you look at the delta between his still very high favorability ratings in the Philippines, but public opinion, as Patrick noted, uh, mistrust of China and support for the United States, uh, this is really uh, uh, an Achilles heel for him. The recent threat, just in the past week or so, uh, to end the visiting forces agreement is another perplexing piece of the puzzle. This came because a senator has been, uh, had his visa to the United States withdrawn. Now, this senator was the former policeman that was in charge of his uh, campaign to gun down drug lords that's led to the deaths of tens of thousands of people without any due process. Um, that's our sovereign right. We can deny con uh, individuals from any country entry to the United States. And I'm sure the Philippines, after listening to me today, might deny me entry. That's their sovereign right. Um, but the reality is we cannot fulfill our Article 5 obligations if they do not fulfill their Article 2 obligations. Their Article 2 obligations say they have to do everything they can to maintain their cap capabilities and readiness to fight for our common defense. And they can't do that without training from the United States. We have over 300 bilateral military exercises a year. And I can't think of any DOD lawyer that would allow us to go in without a VFA and conduct those trainings. We provide hundreds of millions of dollars a year in economic assistance, military assistance, counterterrorism assistance, law enforcement training. Uh, the Philippines is the largest recipient of surplus US weapons. And we indeed have provided them with the most sophisticated weapons in their arsenal. Um, let me just conclude by saying this. The Chinese 
are really, really good at pushing and pulling back. They have a rheostat for each country in the region. The Philippines they use more often, more frequently, more aggressively. The Chinese will send in survey ships to Philippine waters. They will park their Coast Guard vessels in Philippine waters. They will deploy their maritime militia into Philippine waters. Um, they will deny Philippines any right to exploit their natural resources. The Philippines has re rewarded the Chinese corporation that built those islands with large contracts. Things like this send terrible messages. The challenge for the Philippines is huge. They're not going to catch up in terms of reacquiring or rebuilding, recapitalizing their naval forces. But there is much more they could do. And until we get a fundamental change in Philippine politics, where the Chinese push Duterte so far that he has no choice, we have what we have. Thank you. Well, Zach, thank you very much. A sober appraisal, but I agree with everything you said. And it is stunning to see that China keeps pressuring Duterte in, in the Philippines, despite the fact that he has done more to curry favor with them uh, for those Belt and Road Initiative investment promises, most of which, as you say, have not been fulfilled. Vietnam has also been pressured with Vanguard Bank and, and the sort of stopping the Vietnamese from trying to develop and exploit and even explore for oil and gas and their waters. Um, incredible, despite the continuation of joint patrols and cooperation. But we're going to turn now to Bic T. Tran, who is a former visiting fellow with the East-West Center in Washington, otherwise living in Belgium uh, before that. And uh, focus is very much on Vietnam's foreign policy, Philippines, other Southeast Asian states' relations with major powers and political leadership. So, Vic, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Collins, for inviting me, and uh, thank you, the Hudson Institute, for hosting this uh, wonderful event. And I'm so glad that to see that so many people showing up today. Um, so I will start with the, the challenges that Vietnam has faced in protecting its claims in the South China Sea and defending its sovereignty. China has uh, repeatedly intruded into Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, interfered with uh, Vietnam's rightful economic activities in its EEZ and continent continental shelf, and uh, militarized uh, uh, reclaimed features in disputed water. So regarding the, the first challenge, um, uh, many of you might know about the incident in May 2014 when China sent a state-owned uh, oil rig into the Vietnam side of the hyperpatherical line, median line of the overlapped EEZ under the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. So, uh, China's pro provocative action uh, was heavily protested and led to the uh, anti-China riots in some central and southern provinces in Vietnam. And the most intrusions was between the 4th of July and uh, 24th October 2019, uh, when China sent a state-owned uh, survey vessel into Vietnam's water near the Vanguard Bank, and which came as close as 65 um, nautical miles uh, off the, the coast of uh, Nguyen province. So, and second, China has systematically interfered with oil and gas development uh, of other uh, claimants in the South China Sea, including Vietnam. So Dr. Connie and Zach already mentioned that. And uh, you know, in the case of Vietnam, for example, uh, in July 2017 and March 2018, um, China ordered uh, the Spanish firm Repsol to suspend two of its projects with Vietnam after China has threatened to attack uh, Vietnamese spaces in the Spratly Islands if the exploration continued. And in the case of Van Gogh Bank uh, last year, uh, China was uh, pressuring Vietnam to stop its project with Russian firm uh, Rosneft. Um, so China's action, you know, coercive actions uh, threaten the uh, regional uh, energy security and also undermine the 
uh, free and open Indo-Pacific free energy market. And furthermore, you know, uh, China has conducted uh, large-scale uh, reclam reclamation to convert uh, uh, you know, reefs and rocks into artificial islands. And Beijing also continued to uh, militarize the South China Sea by deploying uh, uh, a wide array arrays of uh, missiles that could be used to deny other uh, countries access to air and uh, maritime domains in the South China Sea. So with limited uh, resources and uh, our capacity, Vietnam cannot do much uh, about you know, China's action in the South China Sea. Therefore, you know, the, the freedom of navigation operations by the United States, United Kingdom, and other countries are very important in upholding international law. Uh, Vietnam also appreciated uh, US statements uh, criticizing China's coercive uh, actions uh, during the Vanguard Bank. So um, in this uh, most recent uh, defense white paper in November 2019, Vietnam for the first time in such document mentioned China by name uh, when expressing its concern over the situation in the South China Sea. So uh, Vietnam's uh, long-standing no uh, three no principle of no military alliances, no siding with one country against another, and no foreign mi uh, military bases, now became four no because uh, Vietnam just added uh, uh, no use of force or threat to use force. And the fourth no actually is done not converge with the first three. Um, however, it signals Vietnam's extreme concern over Chinese actions because uh, China has used force against Vietnam <coughs> in the South China Sea twice in the past. So the first time was in uh, 1974. China invaded uh, the Paracel Islands uh, held by the Southern Vietnamese regime at that time and killed more than 70 Vietnamese soldiers. And then again in 1988, uh, China is forced to seize several features of Vietnam uh, in the Spratly Island. So of course that uh, the international environment today is very different. That makes the use of force less likely, but Vietnam remembers the past very well. And by stating the, the norm, uh, you know, the very well-known international norm of non-use of force or threat to use force, Vietnam expressed its intention to avoid starting an armed conflict with China and, and wish that China would do the same. Um, there is some concern that, you know, Vietnam may be, you know, uh, tying its own hands by renouncing its, uh, the, the use of force in territori territorial disputes. But I think it's not the case because uh, right after the Forno, um, the Vietnam's uh, white, uh, white paper states that depends on circumstances and specific conditions Vietnam will consider developing military and defense uh, relations with other countries, regardless the differences in uh, uh, political regimes or levels of development. So I think, uh, to my knowledge, is this the first time that Vietnam explicitly gives room for interpretation of its trino principle. It will pave the way for Vietnam to deepen uh, defense cooperation with the United States, Japan, India, Australia, and other countries in the future. Um, but it's important to note that Vietnam emphasizes uh, an, you know, a foreign policy of uh, independence and self-reliance. So before working with other countries, um, Vietnam started its military, uh, military modernization programs uh, by purchasing weapons and developing its uh, defense industries. Um, but, you know, uh, Vietnam will never catch up with uh, China in terms of military power. And Vietnam also tried to uh, um, improve its uh, um, law enf enforcement and maritime capabilities by upgrading its Coast Guard. Uh, but with a long line of um, the coastline, with very long coastline, Vietnam does not have enough uh, capacity to oversee its vast EZ. Uh, 
therefore, working with other countries like the United States is essential to Vietnam. Um, but because of Vietnam's long-standing free no and now for no principle, the best way for the United States and other countries to help Vietnam in the South China Sea is to provide it with assistance to help it uh, improve its maritime capabilities and protect its maritime domains. So in Japan, uh, the United States already uh, provided uh, partial boats to Vietnam. So what I want to add is that first, Vietnam should consider uh, to improve its uh, uh, maritime domain awareness by upgrading its communication system because it would, would be more efficient in uh, overseeing its water. And second, it would be desirable if the United States and other countries can work together to o avoid some overlap and to better assist uh, Vietnam as well as other Southeast Asian countries. So I stop here to give some space for Eric. Excellent. Well, wonderful um, sort of comments and introduction. And yes, I think we will be turning now to Derek Grossman, who is joining us in California. He's a senior defense and Indo-Pacific expert uh, and analyst at the RAND Corporation, uh, more than a decade of experience in the intelligence community, including as the daily intelligence briefer to the director of DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, briefer to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian Pacific Security Affairs, uh, as it was known then. Um, and Derek, over to you for some initial comments. OK. Thanks. Can everybody hear me there, I hope? We can. Yes. Um, Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks to the Hudson Institute, and thank you, Dr. Cronin, for inviting me to speak today. Sorry I can't be there in person, um, but like you said, I'm on the Pacific uh, over here, and I get to look at it regularly and thoughts about what's going on in the region, so it helps a lot. Um, following up on Beek's uh, uh, presentation, um, you know, clearly China has become increasingly assertive in patrolling and defending the features within its um, nine dash line that overlap with Vietnam's exclusive economic zone. And of course, we can go back to the Battle of the Paracels in 1974 and the fighting at Johnson South Reef in, in 1988 for earlier instances of armed conflicts between Vietnam and China and the South China Sea. But more recently, the watershed moment for Hanoi was the May 2014 Haiang Shiryo 981 uh, incident in which Beijing placed an oil rig in disputed waters near the Paracels. And this led to a month-long standoff in which China deployed overwhelming force to the region, including not only Chinese Coast Guard, but also its armed fishing fleet and its Navy and Air Force, and Navy and Air Force assets as well, although the latter were not used. Um, although the, and so although the PLA did not fire shots during the standoff, the Chinese Coast Guard rammed a number of Vietnamese vessels until the incident ended when Beijing withdrew the oil rig after regional and international condemnation. The severity of the Haiyang Shiryo 981 oil, oil rig incident clearly convinced Vietnamese leaders that the relative calm in the South China Sea since March 1988 was over. Um, and following the incident, we saw a new term called the new situation started, started to appear uh, in, in conjunction with China more regularly in Vietnamese Communist Party speeches, official documents and conversations with Vietnamese interlocutors to underscore, from their perspective, the deterioration of Vietnam's security environment as a result of Beijing's increasingly assertive behavior. The next and, la and latest major incident in South China Sea came over the summer of 2019 near the westernmost feature of the Spratly Islands, which is known as Vanguard Bank, and that's within Vietnam DEZ. Vanguard Bank is a key hydrocarbon extraction point in the South China Sea. China sailed its geological survey vessel, the Haiyang Deger 8, to the area, and after resupplying at Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratlys, the ship came back to loiter in Vietnam DEZ for several weeks before heading back to China. So during the standoff at Vanguard Bank, Beijing um, you know, once again employed both its Coast Guard and its fishing militia, and Vietnam responded by dispatching Vietnam Coast Guard and other law enforcement vessels um, from Cameron Bay. Um, China's main point of protest seems to, be, seems to have been that Hanoi's joint production of the site with countries external to the South China Sea, including the U.S., Russia, and Japan. Um, Haiyang Deger 8 departed Vietnam DEZ following the end of, of drilling operations. Now, in the aftermath of Vanguard Bank, I have written that Vietnam's security strategy has begun to show limitations and shifts in thought. According to Resolution Number 8, which was issued by the Vietnamese in July 2003, 
and it's the core of Vietnam's foreign and security policy, as far as I can tell. Um, Hanoi seeks to simultaneously cooperate and struggle against both adversaries and friends alike. Although China is, in Vietnamese parlance, a comprehensive strategic cooperative partner, the loftiest title granted to any major power, bilateral relations are obviously quite complex. On the one hand, China is Vietnam's largest economic partner and the inspiration for much of Vietnam's culture and governance. The two have been comrades in arms since the establishment of their respective states and have fought together against Western powers. On the other hand, the South China Sea has deepened Vietnamese suspicions of Chinese intentions. And by the way, there are a host of other issues at play too beyond the maritime domain, which we usually don't focus on as much in the West. And these include Belt and Road Initiative and how Vietnam is thinking about that in terms of China's designs on Indochina and its neighbors, specifically with its neighbors, Cambodia and Laos, uh, and, and, and other uh, issues associated with BRI, such as environmental destruction uh, because of damming of the Mekong River and the effects downstream to the lower Mekong, which is, uh, which is uh, the breadbasket of Vietnam. Um, um, so, but getting back to the South China Sea, so Vanguard Bank demonstrated that China was not going to leave until its objective of ousting foreign drilling was met. This is in stark contrast to the 2014 oil rig, oil rig incident in which Beijing backed down due to international and regional pressure. The key takeaway is that China is different these days. Um, Beijing cares much less about optics and is willing to stick it out to see the mission through. In fact, a Vietnamese interlocutor told me privately that Hanoi really believed um, during the Vanguard Bank crisis that Beijing would remove the Haiyang Dijer 8 um, before the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China parade on October 1st. And Hanoi was apparently surprised when this didn't happen. The reality is China's military strength continues to grow, adding to its confidence and its militarized Spratly and Paracel Island features to further enable sustained power projection into disputed regions. All of this means that Vietnam should recalibrate cooperation and struggle to favor struggle activities over accommodating Beijing through, through cooperation. The good news is I think we're already seeing this take place, albeit slowly. For example, in November, Vietnam publicly threatened to take China into international court following in the footsteps of the Philippines in 2016 to contest China's expansive sovereignty claims. Another concrete example is Vietnam's push, according to an article released last week, to reinvigorate the creation and maintenance of maritime militias, essentially a rival to China's fishing militia. Perhaps the most significant example of a trend toward greater struggle is found in Vietnam's latest defense white paper. Released in November, the paper seems to suggest that Vietnam might have to strengthen defense ties with the U.S. if Beijing's bad behavior pers persists in the South China Sea. Despite Hanoi's ca cautious approach toward, toward its larger northern neighbor, the 2019 defense white paper is more negative on China than the, than the 2009 paper or any previous version. In 2009, the white paper mentioned the word China only four times in the main narrative. And that's, of course, not including the appendices. Um, and the description was exclusively positive highlighting constructive bilateral activities such as the limitation of the Gulf of Tonkin and the land border. Contrast that with the 2019 defense white paper in which Hanoi brings up China eight times, three of which are negative references related to Beijing's destabilizing behavior in the South China Sea. Buried within the new defense white paper are also subtle messages of opportunity for Washington. The white paper, for example, uses the term Indo-Pacific, quoting, quote, Vietnam is ready to participate in security and defense cooperation mechanisms, including security and defense mechanisms in the Indo-Pacific region. By using this term adopted by the Trump administration, Vietnam is likely making it known to China that it supports the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. Vietnam knows well that words matter, and in this case, Indo-Pacific has apparently been uttered only one other time that I could find by a Vietnamese leader, and that was during the late uh, President Tran Dai Thuong's uh, March 2018 visit to India. Thus, any further mention of Indo-Pacific is quite significant. The defense white paper further notes that, quote, depending on the circumstances and specific conditions, Vietnam will consider developing necessary, appropriate defense and military relations with other countries. 
Although Hanoi in, 2000, in, in the 2009 defense white paper also underscored the need for strengthening bilateral defense ties with countries that could support Vietnamese national interests, the addition of the clause, depending on the circumstances and specific conditions, end quote, in the 2019 version indicates there is now a causal linkage between the deterioration of Vietnam's external security environment and the, na and the nations in which it chooses to deepen defense cooperation. So a reasonable, a reasonable interpretation of this is that if China's bullying, be bullying behavior in the South China Sea continues, Vietnam finally can promote um, America's status to that of a strategic partnership, signaling mutual long-term interest to balance against China. I'll just sum up by saying that U.S. defense planners will be sorely disappointed if they read too much into v Vietnam's heightening struggle posture. Cooperation is still very much in effect because Vietnam does not want to unnecessarily trigger China's wrath in the South China Sea or elsewhere. And signaling openness to a stronger relationship with the U.S. has not, as of yet, come with any real changes in the U.S.-Vietnam security relationship. My unsolicited suggestion is for the U.S. to allow the situation in the South China Sea to unfold organically <laughs> and let Vietnam come to, Washington's, to Washington for support. In the meantime, the U.S. shouldn't fret about expanding defense and security cooperation as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy, but simply focus on deepening current security engagements. Washington, Washington should also take solace in Vietnam's expanding security relationships throughout the region and beyond, with Japan, Australia, and India in particular, who are all participants along with the U.S. These relationships should, strong, should greatly complement Washington's activities to keep the Indo-Pacific free and open from Chinese coercion. Vietnam's chairmanship of ASEAN this year and its concerted drive within that box to the code of conduct on favorable terms of, mar of maritime counterclaimants against China is also very much in U.S. interest. In all of these activities, the U.S. should be able and willing to help out if or when called upon. Forcing Vietnam to choose between the U.S. and China, which is kind of what we're seeing right now, is simply counterproductive. Vietnam gets it, and they're on the front lines. Countering China is quiet, quietly Vietnam's goal, and as the defense white paper lays out, Hanoi is signaling further interest in security ties with the U.S., that in and of itself should be very encouraging to Washington, and I appreciate everyone for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Well, Derek, thank you very much. Um, an excellent set of remarks from all the panelists. I wanted to uh, ask a, a first round of questions before we go to the audience. Um, and Derek, I want to start with you since you're on the line here and pick up on where you left off on the idea of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, chairmanship that Vietnam currently holds, and this will come into a question that maybe respond to Dick and maybe Zach and others, on um, a code of conduct. And the fact is that uh, China has announced they would like to see a resolution of a binding code of conduct. Um, uh, and um, with Vietnam in the chair, um, that is the most difficult diplomatic uh, dance for Beijing in some ways. But if they can convince Hanoi that this is this is a deal that will be in their interest and they can bring this home, um, they might be able to finish a code of conduct. Is that out of reach in your mind in terms of is that just is this never going to happen because we've been at this for 18 years at least since the declaration of conduct. Um, there isn't an agreement between the claimant states and China um, and nobody wants to give in uh, to China. But you know, you mentioned that Vietnam does want to want to have a, a good resolution out of this code of conduct. So how do you see this playing out in this diplomatic calendar year here where, where Vietnam is in the chair? Well, thanks for that question. Um, so my understanding is, as you say, I mean, we've been at this for 18 years now. So I mean, if you know, past its future, it's still going to be a really um, tough road to get to a conclusion. So my understanding is that China wants a code of conduct signed, sealed, and delivered by the end of 2020, this year. But um, that is not the position necessarily of the rest of the ASEAN countries, because there is a single draft negotiating text that has been read one time, I believe, in 2018, or it might have been 2019, but still needs to be read, allowed, and agreed upon two more times. And so the timeline for the others seems to be the end of 2021 at the earliest. And so what I think is going on here is that China wants to come to a quick conclusion because um, 
it knows what Vietnam's position is on the South China Sea, and it's a really, really um, tough position to, to accommodate. Uh, there were leaked details of Vietnam's position in a Reuters article, I think it was um, over a year now ago, and basically China doesn't want things like China, to, or excuse me, Vietnam, things like Vietnam does not want China ever to declare a South China Sea aid is. They want an end to the militarization of the features, no more land reclamation. Um, you know, so th there, there are things in there um, that certainly would be difficult for China to accommodate. And it feels like, I think China thinks that, that if they can try to ram it through, then Vietnam won't have time to get the others on board with those, with those concepts. So that's just my opinion, and I, would, I look forward to what others have to think about it. Vic, do you want to pick up this issue at all on the code of conduct? Do you have any views on whether this seems a realistic goal? So uh, I think that um, uh, 2020, I don't think uh, they can accomplish that. And you know, we talked about a lot about uh, the desire to have a code of conduct. But then, you know, um, I heard that you know China is pressuring uh, 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 ASEAN to you know like in some, you know, some of the terms, you know, like um, forbidding them to, you know, like have uh, joint exercise or other activities with uh, external uh, powers. So I think, you know, in that case, maybe uh, um, having a binding code of conduct maybe is not a good idea. And, uh, ASEAN have to work really hard to negotiate with China on that. Good, and, and Zach, the United States just conducted uh, the first, I think, freedom of navigation operation, Innocent Passage at least, uh, near Fiery Cross Reef this month. Um, Fiery Cross Reef doesn't have territorial seas under international law, going back to that PCA ruling that you referred to, which was such a landmark. Um, and, and yet it didn't stop the Chinese from claiming this is navigational hegemony on the part of the United States and uh, doing a bit of saber rattling on this issue. How, how do you view right now the effectiveness of America's freedom of navigation operations and the ability to reassure the Philippines or Vietnam or other Southeast Asian countries that the United States wants to try to preserve uh, sort of benchmarks against coercion and, and deterrence for peace? I think the phone ops are absolutely essential. The United States Navy and Air Force will fly and sail anywhere in the world where international law allows, and, and we will push back against excessive claims, and we should. Um, my concern, though, is that right now in Southeast Asia, we have a one-legged stool. It is phone ops and nothing else. Once you took away the TPP, and the economic foundations that keep us committed to the prosperity and peace of the region, we're not looking so good. Overall, we're not looking like a strong and robust or reliable treaty ally. Look at what we're doing with the Republic of Korea in terms of uh, the basing negotiations or with Japan. Um, you can look at uh, uh, US commitment to international laws, regimes, and norms. This is not just a Trump position, a Trump administration position. This has been going back years. Um, so I think that anything that keeps us there, we're looking very militarized. And that is just not sustainable. Well, and, and this is a larger discussion, and I wish we had, uh, you know, even more hours to talk about this, but it is important that the United States, working with uh, other allies and partners, look at major investments. Um, and there's increased discussion going on in this town, Washington, right now, with the uh, Development Finance Corporation, finally, uh, under new leadership, new guys, cooperating with JBIC on the Japanese, with Australia, with other countries, whether in the South Pacific or Southeast Asia. It's a, it's a you know, too little too late in some ways, but it's starting to build up, and I'm hopeful that we'll be filling some of that vacuum that you're right has been left, especially when the United States walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement. Um, you know, uh, you know, I want to I want to jump over to to Southie for just a minute because the, you know, on the military side, on the flip side of this, is the sort of really thorny question of American hard power capability because we've played this historic role since World War II that we're going to be able to deter invasion in, in, in uh, Taiwan, for instance. Mm -hmm. and, and it's Taiwan, which is another claimant state in the South China Sea that we seldom talk about, 
because it's in such a unique situation. Um, but, but Seth, in terms of the pressure that Taiwan is under and the ability of the United States to actually deter China to the extent that their threats are real as opposed to political gamemanship and, and political psychological operations against Taiwan, um, you know, are you worried in the coming years, even this year, <laughs> that China might threaten and actually use force against Taiwan? Or the United States, will we be there with a Navy able to stop us? The picture that we used to advertise this whole event, I, you notice the, the aircraft carrier battle group. It was the two US uh, aircraft carrier battle groups in the 95, 96 Taiwan crisis that many would say that was the beginning of the PLA Navy's growth. That was when they started to introduce submarines uh, in a big way. That was when they really started to build up their missile capability, their anti-access air denial. And they've been working ever since to try to sort of push us out and divide the alliances and partners on this. So how do, how do you view that military hard question on a Taiwan invasion scenario right now? But you ask if I'm worried, and I, I say, <clears throat> I exist to worry. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you. The record of this administration on uh, <clears throat> military assistance to Taiwan is much better than the previous administration. Uh, in the previous administration, the arms sales, military assistance, so on and so forth, was sporadic, um, and the intervals between arms sales, for example, were measured in years. Uh, this administration has done much better on that. Uh, but there's, there are all sorts of um, things that could be done on the military side that are not being done, and there are also actions that could be taken on the diplomatic and economic side that um, sort of are, if not beyond the horizon or at, at the horizon. Uh, we don't have much, the United States doesn't have much reaction when China peels away another, um, another uh, diplomatic, another state that recognizes Taiwan, however small they are. Uh, <clears throat> There's no joint command center um, to coordinate operations in a crisis or for humanitarian affairs or disaster relief, and there ought to be. Uh, the Taiwanese are trying mightily uh, to build their own submarine, and there are a lot of things that are um, extremely complicated about doing that, and there are many things that the Taiwanese can do just fine by themselves, but we, um, we're not there where I think it would be helpful for us to be there. And we continue to uh, treat Taiwan uh, across the board, um, where Vice President Pence stood on this platform a year and, a year and a half ago and said that we need a whole government approach to, to China. Um, we continue to our relations with Taiwan continue uh, on the basis of an agreement that's over 40 years old now um, and really needs to be looked at again and uh, with a, a particular view toward um, understanding <laughs> what our accession to various uh, of Beijing's demands from 40 years ago means today. Um, for example, the representative from Taiwan isn't allowed to live in this house. Um, you know, minor example, but uh, important. So um, to make a sh brief statement of it, there's been improvement, and there's a long way to go um, to, uh, there are many improvements that, <laughs> that should be made, um, not with the intent uh, of antagonizing China, um, but with the intent of making it clear that uh, the United States stands by the Taiwan Relations Act and um, is interested in deterrence. And, and a great answer, and we recognize as well there's strong economic components here as well. There was a great column in today's Asian Nikkei Review, for instance, saying that the most important strategic test for Tsai Ing-wen right now is convincing investors 
that Taiwan's economy can grow despite the obstacles that Beijing will put in its way. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. To, well, uh, and a free trade agreement would a free trade agreement could be, be very helpful. Um, very helpful indeed. I want to turn back to Natalie right now and talk about Indonesia's regional leadership. Now, this is a, a tough question for an Australian to answer, maybe, because every time the Americans say, hey, couldn't Indonesia play a bigger role in the region? Australians say, why should they play a bigger role? We play a bigger role. But, but you're an expert on Indonesia. And I'm wondering about um, you know, how realistic that is that they could stand up and play, because they are the largest Southeast Asian country. They, they have a strong sense of independence. And, and then, in particular, and I have a question here about Indonesia's leadership or partnership in the trilateral uh, cooperation, uh, cooperative agreement with the Philippines and Malaysia and the Sulu Sea, and whether that is in any way a sign that Indonesia's you know, prototyping that kind of larger regional role, or whether it's really just a, a small, relatively uh, you know, localized action. And, and Zach may want to weigh in on the, on the TCA as well. <laughs> but Natalie. Yeah, sure. I mean, actually, as an Australian, we're quite comfortable with Indonesia taking the lead on certain issues. And I think the optics of that are, in particular, quite important. Okay. Um, we recognize that, obviously, we have a close alliance with the United States. And there are certain things that we would like to take the lead on and encourage. Certainly, our participation in the quadrilateral is extremely important. But as is always the case when I'm back in Canberra, the conversation always sort of says, yeah, but if we're just a bunch of US allies plus India, the optics of that aren't about getting buy-in from the rest of the region. And so definitely there are times where our leaders in Australia say that ASEAN centrality remains a key component of any kind of agreement or normative regime within the Indo-Pacific. But we always get stuck on, well, what does ASEAN centrality look like? And so it's one thing to kind of push that forward, and it's another question entirely to sort of say, well, yes, we support ASEAN leadership, but getting ASEAN to work on some of these issues, you know, as we talked about with the Code of Conduct, is a completely different kettle of fish. Which is why, in my view, getting some of the key states within ASEAN that are willing to push forward, states perhaps like Indonesia um, and others, maybe Vietnam as well, is the key, is okay, well, we can't get ASEAN all together at, at, uh, at once. How can we start to focus on pockets of leadership within the Indo-Pacific and start to gain momentum like that, which was part of my justification for advocating why an India-Indonesia pillar as a, as a departure point for leadership within the Indo-Pacific is an alluring idea. It is one around which then you can start to bind other partners. And on your note about emergence of leadership and trilateral configurations, the Australian, Indian, and Indonesian navies have held talks recently as well. That may or may not eventuate into something. But again, some of these nascent conversations, if you see them as sort of overlapping pockets of minilateralism, in some could then start to encourage much more a regional conversation about who we are. Now, some of the problem about talking about leadership within the Indo-Pacific um, starts with a definition, a blurry definition of what the Indo-Pacific is. Mm. And depending on, on who you are in that particular construct and depends on how you define it, and certainly for Australia, some of that extends from the uh, eastern side of, of Africa, um, sort of more or less into the Pacific, but even then that's a little bit vague for us. And for Indonesia, again, that will be a slightly different emphasis. Having said that, there are a number of core states within the Indo-Pacific, and certainly emerging powers like Indonesia, India, South Korea, Japan, Australia, all the sort of middle powers, so to speak, um, as, as problematic as that term is, are the kinds of states that could show much more of that kind of assertiveness. And um, you know, provocatively, I might even throw it open to the, the rest of the panel, is it time to sort of restart the conversation about Nadi Metalagawa's Indo-Pacific Treaty? Uh, maybe this is not something that's feasible within the next few years, but as is always, a lot of these regimes, we can start a conversation now to talk about what are the kinds of standards of behavior we would expect everyone from you know, the greater states to the middle states to the smaller states as well. But certainly starting to talk about these kinds of normative regimes necessitates and a question of well, what is the Indo-Pacific? How do we want to behave? And are we, who can we accept as, as forming a form of leadership in that as well? It's a great question, although it, it's really the Southeast Asian countries that seem not to be as eager on it as maybe the countries outside of Southeast Asia. Because um, it, it would be a great way to sort of set a code of conduct that the international community could use. Um, and it would reinforce and really help defend Southeast Asian countries. But if they don't want to sort of back it, or if they're afraid because China's going to put too much pressure, and, and maybe Zach, I mean, they, even just thinking about the Duterte interaction with Beijing again here, and how, you know, is he really on, on these issues, you know, is he committed to <laughs> Southeast Asia? Or, is he, or is, does he really think that China's 
his ticket for development, and, and that's why he's just going to continue to ride this, this China policy toward this, or is he willing to sign on something you know, beyond the Sulu Sea trilateral, uh, you know, an international agreement that would, would set standards for Indo-Pacific conduct? Um, my guess is he really has hitched his wagon to China. That mm -hmm. He thinks this is where the development is going to come from. Um, I think he's wrong. Um, but he is much less concerned about ASEAN centrality than, than leaders in the past. Um, the, if I can make a quick point Please. about the uh, trilateral patrols. Um, one of the problems is that with Indonesian leadership is it, it's just not there. And, and it comes from the top. And, and I think it, we, we see it that Jokowi just does not want to have, or foreign policy is just not a priority for him. And, and even the military leadership, just the dearth of, of assets that they have for these patrols limits what they can do. The other thing is that we have a multilateral fusion center based in Singapore for the Strait of Malacca. And that's actually been very successful. Countries from all over the region are sitting there in the same suite. They're sharing intelligence. Um, you can't say, I didn't get the memo, because you're literally right across in the cubicle away. Um, that did not happen with the trilateral patrols, and it should have. Um, there's no single fusion cell, because all three countries want it. Uh, the Singaporeans have tried to, to expand uh, the Changi Regional Center to include the Sulu Sea. That has not happened yet. Um, I have suggested in the past, well, why don't you put it in a neutral country? Put it in Brunei. Um, but there should be a place where the three countries are actually sitting there coordinating <coughs> on, on a daily basis. And, and that hasn't happened. The Singaporeans have tried to support that. The Australians have been interested in supporting it. The United States has. And it just hasn't happened. So there's a limit to how, how much that trilateral patrols uh, coordination will happen. Mm -hmm. Can I quickly just, Zach, uh, ask you about the potential for growing back the defense relationship with Bangkok. I mean, are we now post-election uh, in, in Thailand, albeit an election that was a bit of a fig leaf, you know, still with General Prayuth, are we, are we in a better position right now politically to deal with our Thai ally than we were a, a few years ago? The fig leaf would allow us to do more I suppose. My real concern um, is that the fundamental values of the Thai military and the Thai elites, they just don't see the utility in the alliance with the United States the way they used to. They no longer see the United States as the guarantor of their elite survival. Um, they're looking to China. They're looking to China in terms of giving them cover for autocracy. They're looking for uh, to China for the Huawei smart cities, the AI, uh, to control the opposition. Um, the real threat to the elites is not external, it's internal. And really for them, it's the threat of republicanism. And uh, America, yes, there were elections, um, and uh, that, that, that gives us a facade or the fig leaf to, to restore, do more on the mill-to-mill -mill side. But um, the Thai military is just getting closer and closer to the Chinese. Um, mm. All their major weapon systems are coming from the Chinese right now, certainly the maritime. Right. Natalie, do you agree with that? I mean, because there's some reason to think that maybe the Thai have always played outside powers pretty well off each other. Um, they were never colonized. Um, that you know they're aware. I'm, I'm worried, more worried maybe about the monarchy and where that's heading right now. Uh, sort of a restoration of a real monarchy in Thailand may be a bigger threat than the military in the short term. But Zach, go ahead. Any time you hear the Thais say they were not colonized, fact check, true. Take a look at a map of the <laughs> Kingdom of Siam in 1898. True. Okay. No, I was nodding in agreement because I, I quite support what Zach says in terms of looking in terms of some of the elite belief systems within militaries, particularly in Southeast Asia. So much of the formative experiences of these militaries, 
is then filtered down into the thinking um, that's amongst the generation today, and even what gets filtered down into the military academies as well. So, you know, to a large extent, Zach is right. There are limitations with a lot of these regional militaries based on how they identify their roles. If they don't self-identify as a military that needs to be externally oriented, and a lot of their continued, um, not only just sense of self of security, but their rent-seeking kind of behaviors are directed inwards, then there are a few incentives for them to expand in the maritime domain, few incentives for them to try and find arrangements with civil partners. Obviously, I've tried to be a lot more optimistic, but yeah, Zach's sort of reality check on that is, is quite, quite appropriate, and particularly for the Indonesian military. As I said earlier, it's long, long land-based focus, plus the interests of some of its elites means that that leadership role can be quite challenging. Um, I have a question here that's been sent in. It says, with regard to Vietnam's relations with the Chinese Communist Party, is there any generational changes in Hanoi's leadership that could see a weakening of those communist common cause sympathies, and could this play out in the maritime differences? And I don't know if, whether, and Derek, maybe you want to talk about the party-to-party -party relations that have been uh, manipulated pretty well from Beijing's perspective in terms of keeping Hanoi in check. Um, but are there changes you know, underway in, in the Vietnamese political elite um, that will affect eventually this historic relationship? I think that um, you know, for Vietnam, you know, like the party-to-party -party relation with China is very important, um, and I think it's the key factor that keep the, that kept the two countries together after the 2014 standoff. Uh, so I think that Vietnam is still trying to uh, you know convince China that Vietnam and China are good friends and they should uh, maintain good relationship, but maybe I. For my opinion, I think, of course, from that incident and the following, the perception of the leadership uh, may change. But uh, uh, in terms of their behavior, but maybe still uh, not uh, very obvious. Derek, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I'll just, I mean, I'll just, I'm definitely no expert on, um, on elite, you know, Vietnamese leadership politics, but I will say that um, in the run-up to the next party Congress, which should take place early next year, um, it, you know, it seems like um, Trung is going to try to pass the baton to somebody who's very much like Trung, and a lot of these folks are, you know, older, not of the newer generation, uh, and they may be more kind of pro-China than some of the other uh, leadership voices in Vietnam. I mean, most of the young Vietnamese I've interacted with, they're, they're fairly pro-American um, and very distrustful of China, but I don't see uh, them moving up in the ranks anytime soon. No. And Derek, while I have you, um, I wonder if you could comment about China's recent reported investments in uh, naval access or air access in, in Cambodia and how that kind of potential basing arrangement could be perceived in, in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I mean, so if you recall from my remarks, I mentioned that Vietnam treats China as a comprehensive strategic cooperative partner, and that is the loftiest label right. that is given to any major or great power. But implicit in that, and I didn't mention it, um, is that actually Vietnam has special relationships of solidarity with both Cambodia and Laos. And these are forged, you know, from the Indochina Wars um, that, that uh, took place, unfortunately, in the 20th century. And so China, or excuse me, Vietnam has always thought that it had um, Hun Sen uh, in Cambodia kind of, in, you know, in its, uh, in its orbit. But that has changed fairly dramatically in the last few years, especially as China's Belt and Road Initiative has provided a lot of funding and, you know, and, and I'm sure in many cases corrupt funding to leaders in uh, Laos and Cambodia. And so I think part of what we're seeing now with, the, with those bases you mentioned is China was able to leverage BRI to convince the Cambodian leadership that it can, it can um, be a little bit more flexible on its no basing policy within Cambodia. And this has really, really significant geopolitical implications for Vietnam, because if you if you think about it, Cameron Bay is the jewel military uh, base on the South China Sea, right? And for forever, they didn't have to worry about their western flank, but now they do. If the reports are true, then the Chinese will at some point be able to operate out of there, making it 
the second official base China has globally, the first being Djibouti in 2016 in Africa. That's a good point. I wonder if we could just get a comment on Singapore for a minute. And, and I mean, one of the uh, significant agreements that we saw this past year was uh, the Singaporeans agreeing to base uh, aircraft out of Guam. Um, they obviously lack uh, airspace in terms of the ability to conduct exercises, but this is a, seems a significant move for Singapore at a time when Singapore has been playing a very careful game and, and rather critical, I think, of even the United States. The, the last Shangri-La dialogue, at least I thought, I thought they were more critical than normal um, of, of, of U.S. posture. And, um, you know, where do we see Singapore playing vis-a-vis -vis China's sort of growing assertiveness in the South China Sea and in Southeast Asia? Um, and how solid is the Singapore relationship with the United States and with other uh, democracies? Does anybody want to take that question? <laughs> Natalie, even, Zach? Um, the United States has two treaty allies in Southeast Asia, but more importantly, we have Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, ties, ties are very important. Uh, uh, between the United States and Singapore. Uh, obviously, uh, they are a key partner in the region. Uh, <coughs> they ha have built a naval base that will uh, uh, serve uh, uh, U.S. aircraft carriers. Uh, more than any other country in Southeast Asia, they want us anchored in the region, probably because if chips go down with Malaysia, we can tow them out to sea, I guess. But. Um, <laughs> The, the Singaporeans uh, buy the most high-end U.S. equipment, which is very important, but unlike other countries, um, they actually train it with it. They fly it. They sail with it. Um, and this is so important because their military really is professional. It is expeditionary. Um, so they are a key partner to us. Um, but I agree. Last summer, uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, they were very, very critical of the U.S. position, uh, that we walked away from the TPP, that we seemed uh, unreliable, that our policies looked transactional. Um, we left them guessing, and the Singaporeans do not want to be left guessing. Um, they are a key partner, but... Uh, there are limits, and uh, the Chinese have played hardball with them before. If you recall a couple years ago, the Chinese seize uh, some uh, uh, Singaporean, uh, uh, a ship carrying Singaporean armored personnel carriers that was returning from exercises in Taiwan. So the, the Chinese uh, know how to apply pressure when, when they want to. Now, so did you want to say anything about this, or Seth? I want to move on to a question about 5G, cyberspace. Um, the fact that we're in this fourth industrial revolution and it's still unfolding, um, it's a digital age in which I've argued in a recent paper with my colleague Ryan Newhart that you know, China's total competition centers on information dominance across the spectrum. And um, you know, Vietnam famously has, has been one of the few countries around the world actually to stand up and say, no, we're not we're not eager to see uh, uh, Huawei in here, unlike, say, our Five Eyes ally, UK, which has just decided that they are going to experiment with letting Chinese read only one third of their messages or something. I'm not sure exactly, I'm not sure how they're gonna they're parse that, but um, the, you know, the, the problem with 5G is that it introduces Internet of Things, which is often jokingly referred to as Internet of Threats, because uh, once you start to have the radio spectrum and the electromagnetic spectrum <coughs> able to be picked off so easily, um, anybody can uh, jam, intercept, spoof, sniff, um, all of these uh, sort of electromagnetic signals. Um, and it's a real way for China to uh, dominate in a digital age. Um, again, Vietnam seems to be acutely aware of this, but I'm not sure other countries there have the you know the bandwidth, no pun intended, to be able to stand up to the price point of Huawei, um, to be that concerned yet about information dominance when they have basic development questions that are facing them. Uh, the political issues internally are, are significant. But how do we see the digital age rolling into Southeast Asia and affecting not just maritime, but, but you know, security overall? Natalie, any thoughts on this? 
For Indonesia, this is an internal security issue, I think, first and foremost. I think Indonesia is starting to think a lot more of these cyber issues. Um, this is not an area that, that I am as, as well versed in, but if you certainly think about the kinds of ways that Indonesia thinks about and the vulnerability of its systems. A lot of it is about the spreading of fake news, the penetration of those kinds of systems. Um, but that will need a lot of, of, of further thought. Zach and I mentioned yesterday that you know, there's a standing up of the Cyber Command. That's not something that's nearly as mature as other Cyber Commands in the region. Um, so again, the way in which Indonesia, its military is thinking about information security is largely focused on um, the spread of information from some of the provinces shutting down the internet in certain areas. But again, if Indonesia is going to get um, serious about this, it's going to have to have, I suppose, an overall upgrade of, of what its own systems may look like and then start to think about these kinds of partnerships. I mean, certainly Australia has thought a lot about the vulnerability of its systems with 5G, but there, even in Australia, there seems to be a mix of policy as well about using certain kinds of, of Chinese hardware and then saying yes to certain elements of, of um, Chinese companies coming in and working with certain kinds of critical infrastructure. So if a country like Australia in itself has a mixed policy, Indonesia, which has a more complex relationship with China, is certainly going to have similar kinds of issues as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in a country like uh, the Philippines, I mean, this is, a, this is an important issue for U.S. security and for Philippine security. And yet, Duterte trying to stand up to Chinese moving in with their price point could be, could be very problematic. I'm, I remember, though, being you know, lectured in Manila not that long ago, saying, look, you Americans keep offering this Cyber 101, but where's Cyber 102 and 103 and 104? So we're partly to fault in terms of our own security assistance, in terms of helping to work with uh, you know, the national security elites and militaries in our allied countries and partner countries in the region on some of these emerging threats. But it, it, again, China's looking like they're going for a big uh, game-changing strategy where they control a lot of the infrastructure and the systems. So it, you know, they build in their superiority on information dominance. They don't have to worry about just intercepting things. They're, right. you know, they're, they're there from the beginning. Um, but any thoughts, Zach, on, on the cybersecurity dimension? You've looked at it certainly on the radicalization and how the, in cyber. but. But we're now looking at how big states could be manipulating this advantage. Uh, Huawei is absolutely critical for, for China's kind of digital Belt and Road initiative. Um, they are moving in full force into the Philippines. Uh, <coughs> Thailand, Malaysia will all have Huawei as the core of their 5G networks. Uh, full stop. Uh, Vietnam has. Uh, held off, but that's because they have their own uh, corporation, Vietel, uh, that is has their own ambitions to uh, 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 grow and tap into the 5G market because they're, they're just so few players right now. You know, there are only three or four around the world major corporations. So China just has this this um, absolute market comparative advantage that that no one else does. But be careful about Vietel. I mean, that's controlled by the Vietnam People's Army. Um, you know, that's it is not an independent firm. Um, they run that for national security purposes themselves. Um, but uh, this is the Americans kind of lecturing Southeast Asian countries about Huawei really has been counterproductive. And there are countries like uh, Malaysia under Mahathir that have really tried to stick it to the United States and say, nope, Huawei is going to be core of our 5G, and we're going to roll it out now, and I don't care what the Americans say. And, and we can't do anything about it. Um, and I, I think that Chinese, uh, if you look at Chinese policy towards Malaysia in the past year, they've actually been held back in some things that the Malaysians have done to the Chinese because Huawei and what they want to do in terms of 5G and controlling the networks is so critically important to their growth and development. In that IC survey that I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, Samsung was seen as the 5G provider of choice in terms of by the majority of elites. Now, that's just maybe because Samsung has a better brand name than Huawei mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, not necessarily that it's that practical. But Viettel is indeed trying to roll out their own 5G by the end of, I think, 2021. Um, I, I guess we'll see how successful that is, but Vietnam's obviously determined to do this. I, I don't know, Derek, whether you want to weigh in on this, on the cyber and the IT uh, front in terms of the relationship or areas for cooperation or competition. 
No, I think I think it's been covered <laughs> sufficiently. Okay, Vic, thank please. you. Yes. So, um, you know, I think that by saying that uh, Vietnam will developing its own 5G technology is um, uh, so Vietnam can appear to China or the United States in different ways that benefit for Vietnam. You know, for example, if Vietnam talks to the United States, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, the U.S. is pushing pressure on its ally to not adopting Huawei technology. So Vietnam seems to, you know, uh, uh, accommodate that. But if Vietnam talks to the Chinese, they can say that uh, they doing that because they have their own capacity to do that. And I totally agree with Zach that, you know, uh, Vietnam, you know, uh, you know, it, it seems to have capacity and, you know, it's uh, in the last 10 years, it has been uh, quite a successful business when it's, you know, it has expanded to 10 or 11 countries, you know. Well, um, this is fantastic. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask each uh, panelist for just any final thoughts, and I'm gonna do it in reverse order, but I wanna first just ask Seth Cropsey, my colleague here, if he were Secretary of the Navy, and you know, you know, where would you, where, <laughs> it is open, yes. <laughs> where would you start with trying to reforge a naval strategy that could affect not only our global needs, but could start to address um, in reverse, maybe, you know, the decline of naval supremacy and the decline of our naval sort of power in the Pacific? Mm. It's a big question, but where would you start with where that? Where would I start? Um, <laughs> the promotion of officers who, um, to senior positions who are strategically minded um, and uh, then I think not then but at, at the same time uh, there simply needs to be a um, the possibility of a discussion um, at the senior levels of the Navy leadership um, about what the strategy is and what it ought to be, or whether it exists. And if it doesn't exist, uh, what's needed in order to create one? Uh, and that means looking at questions like, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, what is it that the Chinese value the most? Um, but I, that's that issue has been, those questions have been subordinated to uh, tactical issues, most important to budgetary issues. Um, and you see that in the ongoing, uh, well, ongoing, the, <clears throat> the sort of contretemps between the, the, the um, Office of Management and Budget and Navy over the size of the fleet. Um, the question that hangs over that and that subtends it is, what's it for? What's, yes. what's the objective? I mean, Secretary Esper has announced that there is now, for the first time in about a decade, a global force posture review underway inside the Defense Department that he intends to finish by about October. Um, you know, would you be making significant force posture changes in the Asia Pacific? According to my idea of what the strategy ought to be, absolutely. Yes. Well, we'll, we'll hear that another day. <laughs> but that's, that's all I need right now. Uh, I want to go back now to just the panelists, and starting with Derek in California, for any final thoughts on this topic, uh, things we maybe have not mentioned. But Derek? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, um, I would just say that we should all keep watch of, um, of um, the Vietnamese leader, you know, Strong coming to uh, to the United States. That was supposed to happen uh, last year, and he got uh, ill, and it didn't happen last year. But there's still talk that it may happen this year, and so it'll be very interesting to see if it does happen. Uh, and in terms of you know meeting at the White House with President Trump, if the two sides raise their partnership to that of a strategic partnership, that would be a pretty uh, interesting and symbolic symbol to China that Vietnam and the U.S. have mutual long-term interests to counter China. 
Well, and this would seem to be a good year to do that, given that this is the 25th year of normalization, uh, anniversary of normalization relations between U.S. and Vietnam. Dick, any final thoughts? Yes, I agree with you and Derek about the strategic partnership because uh, even though that you know some Vietnamese and even U.S. officials said that there is no difference between you know comprehensive partnership or strategic partnerships, but in my opinion, you know, uh, first is it will more simply and also at the same time, I think it will provide a more uh, like comprehensive framework for deeper cooperation. I can see China lobbying for yet another title, uh, you know, already in, in response to the Americans pushing for a strategic partnership. But I think, yes, this is the way. Zach Abuza, any, any thoughts on issues, again, we've discussed or not discussed? I, I would encourage people to think a little bit about why and when China acts aggressively in the South China Sea. And there's an assumption that they do so out of strength. Right? They have a certain degree of capabilities. The economic growth has allowed you know, 90 plus naval vessels to be commissioned last year. But there's another argument that says maybe they're going to be doing acting out out of weakness. Right? What happens when things go south? Because China's such a, I don't want to say fragile state, but it's a brittle state. What happens when demonstrations increase or the government is looking weaker, there starts to be a little bit more internal dissent against uh, Xi Jinping's consolidation of power. Um, I start to wonder that, that, that a, a weaker China could be actually more disruptive in the South China Sea because you need to wave the nationalist flag. You need to create those external uh, threats. So China is actually something to watch. I'm not a China person, but uh, from my vantage in Southeast Asia, I, I really like to, to think about when and why China's going to act and towards what country in particular. Indeed. Uh, the coronavirus reminds us of just how fragile things are globally and in China. And uh, when I'm uh, next month, uh, my Australian colleague John Lee will be here talking about one of his reports on the fragility of the Chinese economy to some extent. So we may be able to test some of these theses, unfortunately, sooner than we'd like. Um, Natalie Sam, any final thoughts here for this panel today? Certainly, just picking back of what Zach said and in reference to the uh, ISEAS report you said earlier, yes, although well, some of the sentiments are, are pro-China in some ways in Indonesia, I want to highlight the fact that sentiment towards China with Indonesia is particularly mixed. Um, and that those feelings are not just because it's China, but that's a feeling towards wanting to guard Indonesian sovereignty. There have been lots of conversations in the country about this new tuna issue. Um, and also, you know, the, the presence of Chinese workers, for better or for worse. But I just want to sort of first characterize the in-country sentiment towards China as, as not being static at all. But the one thing I want to highlight is if we're thinking about Indonesia, yes, for the next five years, Indonesia may not be so externally focused. What we can do is to support some of the consolidation within the country with its maritime focus. There are uh, no less than 11 agencies dealing with maritime issues, you know, other than the military. So asking ourselves, what can we do to support some of the non-military capacities within Indonesian militaries and agencies would be quite useful, um, asking how we can support a cohesive policy and a certain range of skills, uh, as mundane as they may seem, from auditing to English language. Um, and then looking further beyond the five-year term, because Jokowi will be limited um, by two terms of his presidency, uh, looking at what kind of president Indonesia might have in 2024 onwards, um, might give us some thought about how we can help support Indonesia become a more of that outward looking actor. It might be a proboscis of Vianto or an ally of his, or it might be somebody else. But the question is, if it's not Jokowi for the next five years, how can we help Indonesia position itself in order to be able to take some of that leadership role that the rest of us might be waiting for? An important question. Anyway, Seth, a final word. Uh. I think I've said everything that I have to say. I, I, I mean, I, I can uh, 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 talk on at length about what I think our naval strategy ought to be, but I don't think this is probably what you want, so um, I'll leave my comments to that. We'll, we'll keep the country waiting on the naval strategy that South Crowns will write about. Well, this has been a, a terrific discussion on an important area with important countries in Southeast Asia and, and thinking about the maritime security dimension that intersects U.S. national security so fundamentally from my perspective. It intersects what China has been pushing, especially in maritime Asia, into the South China Sea and in Southeast Asia. Again, read our report, uh, Total Competition, which is online. Um, I think um, 
you know, for all the, the challenges that China poses, though, to Southeast Asia, I'm still impressed with the resilience of Southeast Asian nationalism, um, politics, countries. Um, not so much their naval capabilities, with maybe some exceptions, like Singapore as a, as a, as a real military power, um, but uh, 